Welcome to Quant Minds International. I'm Lili Nguyen and I'm joined by Damiano Brigo, Chair and Head of Group Mathematical Finance at Imperial College London. So Damiano, tell us, what are the latest trends in quantitative finance? Well, in the last few years, uh, we have seen a number of uh, developments uh, from these valuation adjustment calculations that turned out to be uh, quite nonlinear and, and general and that required a much more holistic uh, approach to modeling that was uh, seen previously and also they require some advanced mathematical tools that have been investigated uh, now mostly in academic research but they're st are still percolating through to practice and there's a lot of open problems with valuation adjustments that have not been sorted out even with the simplest ones so i would say that's still a very relevant area then uh, I would say we have seen the increase of use of technology. That seems to be a trend that is, you know, some, sometimes a hype and sometimes a real um, a trend in the industry. And we, we saw the increased use of machine learning. Uh, typically, of, we talk about fintech a lot. So the other question is, uh, what will be the impact uh, the, of all these methods uh, in the profession of a quant? Is, is uh, some people come to the point to say that quants uh, will become unemployed because most of their job will be done by machines, by models, by computers, by algorithms. Others are more skeptical and don't believe that this is really going to happen. So if, but I think that the change is real. There's much more reliance on technology now to the point that often there are even researchers who want to give up models almost completely and let the machine deduce the dynamic of the market from the data. So the data somewhat kind of speak for themselves, if you like, which is, uh, I think, again, quite an exaggeration. But uh, this is something we're really seeing. So I would say the main trends are, you know, these kind of more holistic modeling approaches and the use of machines uh, more and more in uh, uh, tasks that usually were, you know, the, the job of a of a quant of an analyst or even for of a trader or of a market maker you know now everything has been automatized and uh, and this is uh, you know showing uh, a lot of activities so definitely this is uh, one of the the trends we're seeing so it sounds like it's a quite a turbulent time in quantitative finance but where do you see the most room for innovation in this sector i think that uh, we have really to under given the emphasis on numerical methods and on ca computational methods on, on artificial intelligence and machine learning i think it's particularly important right now to clarify the limits of these methods the, the merits but also the limits of these methods to avoid the dangers coming from an excessive reliance on these uh, uh, you know uh, tools and one, one typical example uh, is interpretability so for some of the uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms so for example deep neural networks or you know long short-term memory network recurrent neural networks these methods uh, are not immediately interpretable you don't really understand uh, in depth what the machine is doing these methods uh, lead to, you know, uh, algorithms that are essentially non-local uh, and uh, non very non-linear. So it's very hard to interpret the relationship between inputs and outputs to understand what's going on. And also the moment the network does not work anymore, what do you do? You know, with the model, okay, the model is never wrong, it's never right 100%. It's a simplification of reality, but as long as it's a mathematical model described by equations and, uh, you know, tools and paradigms that you understand, the moment the model does not work, you can try to uh, adjust it, include more inputs, you know, change the dynamics, and you can do a number of things. When, when you are using a deep neural network or one of these long short term memory networks or recurrent neural network, this is much harder because you don't really know what the, the machine is doing uh, to some extent. It's really a lot of, very much of a black box. So the interpretability or exp the way to explain what the network is doing is a big barrier, especially if you use these techniques in risk management the regulators will not accept a black box, uh, you know, without uh, any 
description or explanation. So the research in inter interpretability of these methods is just it just begun, but it's a major challenge. Challenge if you want to keep using these methods in finance, and, and, and we should, there's no going back, but we should do it very carefully and we should work on the interpretability. There are a few techniques based on surrogate models where basically you try to fit uh, an interpretable simple model like a regression or you know maybe a decision tree to a small portion of input and outputs of, of the network locally. And then you can explain locally what the network is doing. Is this a real explanation? I think the main features of these methods are that they are non-linear and non-local. So the moment you linearize them and put some you know, local models, an atlas, if you like, of local models to explain what the network is doing as a whole, you're not really explaining it. So, and other methods like Shapley values from cooperative game theory, they are purely computational, uh, combinatorial, sorry, I meant and they don't really explain what's happening either. So I think we really need a breakthrough in this area to feel confidence with, this, with these methods, to have a more of a feel for what they're doing really, and also for knowing what to do if the method goes wrong. You know, with the model, we kind of have some margin on how to move and so on, but with this method, it's very hard to understand what to do. So I think that is the, the, the main point I would like to make this year, uh, the interview of the conference, that we really need to work more on transparency and interpretability of these methods. Yeah. They are important, but we cannot go on, you know, uh, with a black box uh, indefinitely. Also, again, as I said, the regulators will want to know what these models do. So we really need to work on that. So besides the panel, you will also be presenting at uh, Quant Minds International this year. Um, what is uh, the one thing that you want people to take away from that? So I would, I'm presenting a, a talk on optimal execution. So when you have to uh, sell or buy a given number of uh, uh, shares, for example, uh, in time without uh, being uh, punished by the market. The market, uh, is, the market realizes you're keen to share a large amount of shares, the price will move against you. So you have to find a way to distribute the, the sale or the, the, the buy order in a way that minimizes the impact uh, of uh, you know, uh, your trading uh, in a negative way against you and also to minimize some sort of risk. So what I'm pointing out this year is that it's very different whether you optimize your trade by assuming that you know all the information at time zero or whether you assume that you will know the information as the market uh, develops, which is the correct thing to do. Often for tractability and computa computational issues, you do the first thing. You assume you make the decision only with the information you have at time zero and you look at nothing else. But this is quite limiting. If you re really adapt your strategies as time moves on to reflect the movements in the market, this is much better. And I investigate how much better it is to be adaptive than it is to be static at time zero. So that's uh, uh, the, my message is if you're trading also with signals, this is very important. It makes a big difference. So you should be adaptive and not be static. In a way. Damien Obrigo from Imperial College London, thank you very much for joining me thank today. Thank you, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.